Welcome to the Facts on Fire Fire Prevention Series. I'm your host, Sonny Cudd, and today we'll be discussing fire safety and target populations. Did you realize that some people are put into unique and sometimes greater risk when fire is involved due to their circumstances? Factors like age, the very young and elderly, physical impairments, the disabled and the visually or hearing impaired, and housing situations, apartment dwellers, manufactured home and rural residents can create distinctive fire risk for the affected groups. We'll start our discussion with special fire safety considerations that need to be taken when the elderly or young children are involved. But first, our spot quiz. Here are some spot quiz questions for you about fire safety of the elderly and very young. What are the four most common fire hazards that affect older people? When is the most dangerous time for seniors to be in the kitchen? What is the leading cause of fire deaths among older adults? What is the main reason children are at greater risk for fire injuries and death? What age should you begin practicing a home fire escape plan with children? Jot down your answers and stay tuned to find out the facts on fire. These hands have done so much in life. They can do so much for life by practicing fire safety. Make your home safe from fire. Learn how to use your fire extinguisher. Plan and practice escape routes. And install and maintain smoke alarms on every level in your home. So you'll be able to give others a hand. Prevent fire, save lives. Go to our website for more information on fire safety. A message from the U.S. Fire Administration. Residential fires injure an average of 3,000 older adults each year, and people over the age of 65 face the greatest risk of dying in a fire. Statistics from the National Fire Protection Association indicate that people over the age of 80 die in fires at a rate three times higher than the rest of the population. Joining me in the studio to discuss fire safety for the elderly is Chief Chris Kaufman. Chief Kaufman is a 16-year veteran of the fire service in both suppression and prevention, and is now serving as Chief of Fire Prevention for his department. Chief, have you seen any fires involving the elderly and what has happened in those instances? Yes, I have, Sonny. In most cases, the elderly will try to put the fire out instead of getting themselves out of the homes uh, to a safe location. Well, Chief, why are, or, or, why are older adults more at a risk of injury and death from fire? Well, most of your elderly uh, move a little slower, have less mobility. In the event there's emergency, they're obviously more slower in getting out. I'm sure there, there's a factor involving medication. Uh, a lot of older folks tend to take a lot of uh, medication. What, what's the factors there? And that is correct. Uh, and it will alter their thinking. And it will affect uh, how slow they're going to get out the residence or the decisions they make. Sure. Uh, living alone is probably another uh, relative factor that's involved in that as well, isn't it? it that is correct. And, and when you're living alone, you don't have anyone to help you. So it's good to have a, an escape plan and have the neighbors involved an event you need some help to get out the residents. Chief, what are some of the more common fire hazards that affect, or, affect the elderly today in our society? Cooking accidents would be uh, the number one cause for the elderly in fire-related injuries. Uh, the unsafe use of smoking materials, I'm sure, is a factor as well. Uh, older, older folks tend to, to smoke uh, alone. Uh, what are some of the causes there? Uh, the elderly sometimes will smoke in bed, which uh, is also the leading cause of fire deaths for the elderly. So I would, I would make the, the, the comment that the elderly should never smoke in bed. Uh, heating equipment, you know, the, the elderly tend to you know, be a little colder in the wintertime and uh, they may have some of the, uh, the portable heating devices. What, what can you tell us about heating equipment in the elderly home? Space heaters uh, should be placed in an area away from any combustible material. Uh, out of the way of uh, the pathways to the exits and should be kept in an area that uh, they can't knock them over to cause fire. And closely monitored, things of that nature. Yes. Uh, faulty wiring, uh, you know, most of the older folks tend to live in some older homes these days. Uh, that, that wiring tends to wear out. Uh, is faulty wiring uh, prevalent in some of these accidents? Yes, it, it, it's a, a big cause of the fires for the elderly. A lot of times you'll see uh, more than one appliance plugged into an outlet or an outlet strip and that tends to overload the uh, circuits in the home and a lot of the wiring is old so it causes sparking or arcing which starts fires. Uh, looking at going back to the uh, cooking side of it, looking at some of those things uh, you know individually, um, breakfast, cooking breakfast, the time of day, uh, how is that uh, affected uh, by the elderly uh, cooking today? The leading time of day for, for fires uh, during breakfast would be 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. 
would you say that it's it's also a fact that uh, you know maybe the the elderly may uh, put something on the stove, tend to wander off, uh, possibly forget about it, in essence just leave it unattended, and that cause an accident? And yes, that is correct. Uh, never should you leave your cooking unattended, and if you leave the room, take a pot holder or a spoon with you that remi reminds you to go back into the kitchen that you're yeah. cooking. Kind of like the old ribbon around the finger. Correct. Right? Uh, proper clothing, I'm sure, is, is important as well, uh, not to wear anything loose or, or anything like that. should always remember to wear tight-fitting clothes, nothing that hangs off your arms, and, uh, and keep yourself conscious of what you're doing while you're cooking. Keep your, your workspace clean, and uh, a clean workspace is a safe workspace. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, in our line of work, we, we have to teach people about grease fires and things like that. Uh, explain to our audience how, how you should bring up that cooking oil as far as heating that oil and things. Well, you should never bring your oil up quickly in temperature. Uh, and always uh, check your products before you put them in the pot. Never, you never want to put frozen food into hot grease because you'll actually cause uh, a ball over. Mm -hmm. And if in the event you have a fire on the stove, Try not to panic. You can easily put the lid on top of the pan and put the fire out. Just kind of smother. That's smother correct. The and fire you can out. smother the fire. And if you have baking soda or keep baking soda in the house, you can throw some baking soda on top of the grease fire to extinguish it. Sure, keep that handy. Yes, sir. Sure. Uh, in the event that there was an accident, uh, you know they weren't able to get it smothered, and their clothes do catch on fire. Uh, what precautions or what actions should they take uh, to to stop that? Obviously, you should stop drop and roll. The elderly should take more of a fall down approach, cover your face and roll back and forth till you extinguish the fire. Okay, great. Uh, let's talk about smoking now. Um, some of the precautions that the elderly can take uh, to avoid smoking accidents in the home. Well, first of all, you want to get an ashtray that has a, a holder in the center of the ashtray. In the event you forget the cigarette in the ashtray, it will fall inside of the ashtray and not outside of the ashtray. Okay. Uh, you know, we all hear about smoking in bed and all that, those types of things. Uh, you know, certainly we, we, sh we wouldn't want the elderly to be lying in bed smoking, lie down on the couch or anything like that. Uh, these ashtrays you're talking about, the safety ashtrays, are those readily available? Yes. Anyone can get those? You should be able to find those at any of your, your regular stores. Okay. Well, when this, you know, at some point in time you've got to dispose of all this. So what would be the proper disposal of, of the ashes and the cigarette butts that come from these ashtrays? Well, I would recommend that you, you wet the cigarettes or put them in a cup of water before you throw them away. Okay. Uh, what are the risks involved with the heating equipment? We talked about that a while ago. Uh, obviously, there are some risks. Uh, what are some things that people should look for when, when purchasing heating equipment? First of all, you want to get a device that has a safety feature. If the, the heating equipment falls over, that it, it would cut the system off. Um, that would stop any accidental fires in the event that, you know, you bump it or knock it over. Okay. Uh, the, we talked earlier about uh, space considerations, where you want to put things and all that. Space considerations, location, uh, where, where are the best places to put these portable heating devices at? Obviously, keep them out of the out of way of any uh, uh, walking paths that are common walking paths in your home and keep them three foot away from any combustible materials in your house. All right. Uh, of course, you wouldn't recommend putting a portable heater, you know, on a dresser or anything, nothing on furniture, anything like that, always on the floor? Uh, always on the floor. You want to have it on a flat surface. Uh, how about, uh, and this seems kind of crazy, but uh, the drying of clothes using these heaters, is that something that's recommended? Absolutely not. Uh, it's not designed to dry clothes. In some cases, uh, you know, the elderly will try to, to heat their clothes up or take the dampness out, and that's not what the product's designed for. So I would recommend not to use it for any of those type of uh, activities. Okay. Uh, we, I mentioned a moment ago about uh, the older homes, the faulty wiring. Uh, certainly there are some electric, electrical concerns out there uh, with the elderly in their homes. Uh, what are some of the things that they should, should, they should uh, look for there? First of all, you may want to have a licensed electrician come in and check your outlets in your home. Sometimes the connections become loose and that would start arcing, which could cause a fire in your residence. And you want to make sure that none of, none of the wiring is uh, uh, frayed. Uh, if you have any extension cords in your house, you should check them to make sure that they're not overheating and that they're plugged in the out outlets completely. Yeah. I can remember seeing uh, uh, little small Walmart type uh, extension cords with nine different things plugged into them, complete overloads. So I know exactly what you're talking about there. Uh, well, let's talk about uh, 
some of the risks that we've discussed, how can older residents uh, prepare themselves should a fire break out? First of all, they should have an escape plan. Uh, Operation e exit drills in the home is the best way to, to prepare yourself in the event you have a fire emergency. And you want to practice those drills so that when you do have the emergency that you, you're not, you don't have to think about it. You can just know what your exits are and, and get yourself out the home safely. And of course the best way to, uh, to implement this escape plan during a fire is to have that early warning device, the smoke alarms and things, things like that. Can you tell us a little bit about smoke alarms? Yes, smoke alarms should be on every level of your house and we recommend also to have them in every, in every bedroom. Early detection will save your life and uh, when the smoke detector sounds, it'll wake you, give you enough time to get out to residence in a safe manner. Getting out to residence, that's kind of an important factor today. Uh, we try to live in a much more secure society. A lot of folks have burglar bars on their, on their homes. Uh, uh, can they present a hazard, and, and what are some of the things that, that, that they need to be able to do with those burglar bars to help their escape in, the, in case of a fire? I would recommend not to use any burglar bars, but in the event that someone does have burglar bars on their, their windows, uh, there are some, some breakaway features. You should practice those features and make sure that in the event that you have an emergency that you, you really know what to do uh, to get them the op to operate. Thanks a lot, Chief Kaufman. Appreciate that. When we return, fire safety for the very young, protecting young children from themselves. Let's summarize some fire safety tips for elderly residents. Never leave food unattended on the stovetop. If you must leave the kitchen while cooking, take a spoon or pot holder with you to remind you to return to the kitchen or use a timer. If a fire breaks out on the stovetop, smother it with the lid and turn off the burner. Never wear loose fitting clothing when cooking, such as house coats and nightwear that are easily ignited by stove heating units. If clothing does ignite, stop, drop and roll. Never smoke in bed or leave smoking materials unattended. Empty ashtrays into the toilet or a metal container every night before going to bed. Or wet cigarette butts and ashes before discarding them into a wastebasket. Give space heaters their space. Don't place them close to drapes, clothing, or other combustible materials. And turn them off every time you leave the room or go to bed. Immediately have any sparking or electrical devices with frayed cords repaired by an expert. And plug only one heat producing or high wattage appliance into an electrical outlet at a time. And finally, have a working smoke alarm and a fire escape plan in place. Practice your plan with a neighbor. And let your local fire department and emergency personnel know of your special needs. It takes just minutes for a fire to race through a room. Fortunately, this is just a demonstration. But the fire in Betty Roach's house was real, set accidentally by her grandson when he was playing with a lighter. I had a lighter and I had a piece of paper. I took the piece of paper, I lit it, and I put it on the ashtray. But, and the ashtray failed. When I got in the hall, smoke alarm went off. And when I got upstairs, the, he was trying to put the fire out. The fire caught the floor and it went under the bed. And by that time, it just uh, got away from me. You can't imagine when I got in that hallway and I heard that smoke alarm go off, how I felt, because I knew they was upstairs. If it wasn't for the smoke alarms, I could have lost my kids. Welcome back to Facts on Fire. In addition to the elderly, one of the highest risk groups for deaths in residential fires is children. Every year, over 800 children, nine years of age and younger, die in home fires, and children under five are twice as likely to die in a fire than the general population. Chief Kaufman, why are children at so much greater risk than the rest of us for fire injuries and death in this country? Because the children are very vulnerable. Uh, they're left a lot of times playing in the house. Uh, the parents are in another room. Uh, they may find a lighter or matches and the curiosity comes out and uh, children have a tendency to play with the matches or the lighter to see how it works. They may have seen mom or dad uh, use the lighter. So a lot of times uh, the children will go into what we call secret places 
uh, in their bedrooms, uh, under their beds, in their closets, and they'll play with these devices and, in most cases, start a fire and uh, the fires get out of control. Sure. What, uh, what are some of the ways to decrease the possibility of children, you know, playing with, uh, playing with, with uh, lighters or matches and so forth? Well, the parents should properly store lighters and matches in a safe location in the house. Uh, what about the child-resistant lighters? They, they have those out there nowadays. Or is that something that uh, people would want to look at doing? Definitely. You, you want to get the child-resistant lighters. And let's make the point that that's not child-proof. They're just child-resistant. So in some cases, the children do know how to, to operate the lighters. They've seen the parents do it before. Sure. So keep the lighters and matches out of reach. Uh, how do you know what to do or what to say if you suspect that your child may be, may be playing with matches or, or lighters? Well, usually there's going to be, there's going to be some indicators. Uh, obviously, if, if you find a lighter in your child's room, the best thing I could tell you to do is bring them, bring them into a room and have a, a discussion, see what they've been doing. Uh, sometimes it's just curiosity. If you realize it's, it's much further than that, I would call in some professional help at that time. Uh, that lack of supervision, probably one of those things. Uh, if we stay on top of things a little bit better, maybe uh, you can head these things off before they happen. Besides playing with fire, what are some of the other hazards that children may face around the home? Uh, the so stove safety would be number one. Uh, when parents are cooking, they need to, to put the pot handles to the side, uh, keep the children away from the stove area, and, uh, and don't let any of the children touch any of the dials on mm -hmm. the uh, stove top. Of course, uh, a lot of folks like to burn candles these days, you know, like the, the, the scents and all that. Can that be a, a, a hazard as far as children in the home? Yes, yes. I would, I would keep candles away from children. Uh, if you're going to burn a candle, put it on a level surface and keep any candles three inches away from each other if, you, if you're burning more than one candle. Okay. Now, every kid likes fireworks, right? I mean, you know, it, it's just a natural curiosity for them. Yes. Uh, what are some of the hazards associated with children, unsupervised children, maybe playing with fireworks? Well, first of all, children should always be supervised when, when shooting fireworks. Uh, I would recommend the younger children below age 14 uh, to not shoot fireworks. Uh, just the, the sparklers alone can produce a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. So if you ask yourself that question, is a sparkler safe? It's not. So I would recommend that the, the parent have to have immediate supervision when, when any of the children are shooting fireworks. Never alone. Never, Never alone. alone. Okay. And look at your warning labels on your fireworks and follow those directions. Yeah, uh, cigarettes, that, that's another. We talked about it earlier. Um, uh, parents smoke in the home uh, or maybe even outside the home, but it's around. Then you maybe have the children who are curious about smoking. Things tend to happen there. That's correct. And, and one thing you want to do is educate your children on what, what, what's the right thing to do in making the right decisions. And uh, keep the cigarettes uh, out of the younger children's uh, reach. No different than we do with the lighters and matches. Uh, home safety. Uh, fire equipment, fire safety equipment in the home, especially dealing with small children. What are some of the things we should look for there? Well, smoke detector would be number one. Uh, and I would have routine uh, fire drills in the home. Uh, in all of our schools, we have fire drills once a month, and we recommend that you go home and do the same thing. Practice your escape plans. Uh, ultimately, the, the smoke detector will save your life. Uh, one thing you see a lot of nowadays, uh, you see it advertised on television, a lot of these baby monitors. Uh, where uh, you know you can get uh, you can keep track of what's going on uh, important that is very important and you should have a smoke detector in that sleeping room with that infant and if the detector goes off obviously you'll hear the baby monitor and know that you have a, an emergency uh, earlier we talked about Edith the exit drills in the home you know it's it's a fact that uh, children as young as three years old can follow this the exit drills in the home or an escape plan uh, as long as it's practiced and, and it's taught and they're able to learn it um, what are some of the things that go along with that? Uh, obviously, practice makes perfect. So you want to you want to reiterate the the procedure over and over, so that that child, in the event they have an emergency, knows what to do. They won't have to think and have a common meeting place outside, to where you know one child's not looking for another child or the parents going back into the residence. You know, practice your exit drills in the home and have a meeting place outside. Thanks, Chief. We'll be back next to review the answers to our spot quiz. Did you know that two-thirds of home fires that kill children occur in homes without a working smoke alarm? When fire breaks out, you and your young children only have seconds to escape heat, black smoke, and deadly gases. 
by installing and maintaining working smoke alarms, families can dramatically increase their chances of surviving a fire. Smoke alarms are a minor investment to protect yourself and your family's future. Now it's time to review our spot quiz. What are the four most common fire hazards that affect older people? Cooking accidents top the list, followed by the unsafe use of smoking materials. Third, the unsafe use of heating equipment like space heaters. And fourth, electrical hazards due to faulty wiring in appliances and older homes or overloaded sockets. When is the most dangerous time for seniors to be in the kitchen? The hours between 7 a.m. and 10 a.m. are statistically documented as the time when most fire disasters happen to the elderly. What is the leading cause of fire deaths among older adults? The unsafe use of smoking materials is the leading cause of fire deaths among older Americans. What is the main reason children are at so much greater risk than the rest of us for fire injuries and death? Curiosity. Over 30% of the fires that kill children are set by children playing with fire, matches, or lighters. By keeping matches and lighters out of children's reach and getting counseling if the situation becomes unmanageable, this statistic will decrease. What age should you begin practicing a home fire escape plan with children? It's been shown that children as young as three years old can follow a fire escape plan if they've practiced it often enough. For younger children, ensure you have a smoke alarm in their bedroom with a baby monitor nearby. Also, keep a baby harness handy should an emergency escape be necessary. Age plays a large part in our vulnerability to fire. If you're elderly and live alone, practice your escape plan with a neighbor. If you're not, visit an elderly neighbor and make sure they have a properly working smoke detector and understand how to check it. And if young children live with you, make sure all matches and lighters are out of sight and out of reach. With age comes wisdom. Help to preserve and share it. The Louisiana School for the Deaf is a residential school for deaf children. They receive their education through sign language. There are 120 students from elementary through high school who live in the dorms. At the beginning of the school year, all the kids who come to the dormitory are informed of the routes they need to take. The bedrooms have red lights that will flash. If the alarm goes off, one of these lights go off, then we know that a fire is broken out. And then we immediately run out of the window and we look for a safe place. I have an alarm system set up that's linked to a local fire station. If the alarm goes off, in my house, the lights will automatically begin flashing. And they'll flash for about five or 10 minutes. And then there'll be a continual beam, and the police and the fire department will come. If I lived in an apartment, I would need um, a light, some sort of alarm system to let me know that there was a fire, an extinguisher, and I would need someone to come and make sure that I was OK. I write with my neighbors. We write back and forth. Sometimes um, I'll gesture with them. They all know that I'm deaf. My neighbor did come one time to let me know about a fire that, was, that had occurred. I was totally unaware. It was about four or five summers ago. And my neighbor ran over and said, come out, come out. Apparently, somebody had flipped a cigarette butt in the boat and had caught on fire. It was too late to salvage my boat. I was happy. It was an old boat. House fires account for 71% of all structure fires and 83% of all fire deaths. For persons with physical impairments, the fire death rate is almost three times that of the rest of the population. In this segment, we will learn some specific actions these people can take to increase their odds of survival. But first, a spot quiz. Here's a fire safety quiz for persons living with disabilities. What are your top two best tools for eliminating fire risks? If you're hearing impaired, what good is a smoke alarm? What's the key to making a clean getaway if your residence does catch on fire? Take your best guess and jot down your answers. We'll review this spot quiz later. In America, there are over 11 million people who are visually impaired and over 28 million 
who are deaf or hard of hearing. During a fire emergency, these disabilities can put these citizens at increased risk of injury or death. Chief Kaufman, what are some of the risks that the physically impaired may face? Uh, decreased ability to react in the event of an emergency, and also uh, the disabled is reluctant to ask for assistance. Well, what are some of the general precautions that a person with a disability can take? Uh, the same as everyone else uh, with modifications based on their disability. Uh, I'm assuming smoke detectors, same as everyone else on every level of the house. Um, I, I would add smoke detectors in their sleeping rooms, of course. Sure. Sure. Uh, escape plan, the same as others, or uh, according to their disability? Uh, according to their disability, uh, if there's special needs, uh, if there's a caretaker, get those persons involved in the escape plan. Uh, it may be a neighbor. Have them involved uh, in practicing ex uh, the escape plan. What about those of us that are in the emergency services uh, arena? Uh, can they check with us, get with the fire department? Uh, and ask for some, some help, let them know what their special needs are? Definitely. I would contact uh, my 911 center in my area and let them know that I'm a special needs person and that information can be passed on to the emergency agency. Uh, would you say it's very prevalent that uh, some people with physical impairments tend to isolate themselves in their neighborhood? Yes, they should stay in touch with their neighbors and also know their limitations and don't be afraid to ask for assistance. Being more specific, how do smoke alarms work as far as the hearing impaired go? There are smoke detectors on the market today that give you a visual signal and also an audible signal. Uh, if you're hearing impaired, you can see the flashing light, uh, and obviously you can hear the, uh, the audible. They also, there is also a detector that vibrates uh, for the blind and deaf, and that detector will vibrate to let you know that there's, there's smoke in the residence. Uh, isn't it also, uh, uh, there's a, an outdoor strobe that's also available to alert the neighbors that something is going on at that home? Yes. I would recommend that you have an outdoor strobe if you're a person with a disability that lets the neighbors and emergency services know that you have a, an emergency in your house. Well, what are some of the, uh, the recommendations as far as installation and maintenance of smoke alarms? Uh, smoke alarms should be checked annually. Uh, we recommend when you change your clock that you change your battery. Uh, and the automatic alarm system, that's also, uh, it's, it's out there, it's available for people? Yes. Uh, the, uh, the fire escape plan, uh, is that something that also needs to be practiced uh, by the impaired? Yes, the impaired definitely needs to practice their escape plan. Obviously, they need more time uh, to get out of the residence, so you want to practice so that you can promptly enact your plan in the event you have an emergency. Uh, things like sleeping arrangements, clutter in the home, uh, mobility requirements, uh, all important factors, true? Very important. Uh, you want to keep a clear path for wheelchairs or walkers. Uh, I would place the disabled in a bedroom that is very near an exit of the residence and obviously keep uh, the, the residence uh, unobstructed from any, anything blocking an exit passageway. We mentioned earlier in the program about burglar bars. Uh, those are some things that are also out there. Uh, yes, the, the burglar bars uh, uh, should have a safety feature that allows them to be uh, breaking away from the house. So those things should be uh, practiced to where they can they get the bars off the windows and be able to exit the residence. The window is their second means of egress out of the residence in the event that the, the exit doors are blocked. So very important then. Yes. Uh, reacting, uh, the reaction of the impaired in case a fire breaks out, uh, what are some of the things that they need to do? They have a fire now. They've got to do something. Uh, what could you tell them? Uh, first of all, I would, I would make some kind of some kind of action to let the neighbors know or the fire department know that I'm, that I'm trapped. Uh, keep a flashlight in your bedroom. Keep a whistle in your bedroom. You want to make some kind of noise to alert the neighbors or other people in the residence to help you get out. Uh, the main thing I would think also would be uh, just don't panic. Uh, if you have all these things in place, you've practiced these things, you should be able to just flow right on through it without any problems. As long as you stay calm, you make that call to 911, right? Uh, we talk about not going in, trying to res return to get any property out or anything like that. Just get out of the house. Get out the house and stay out. What's, well, what if you, uh, God forbid, trapped uh, and you just can't get out? You want to protect yourself. You want to close the bedroom door. Uh, that would last around 15 or 20 minutes. Block any cracks at the bottom of the door with a towel or bed linen and, and make your way to the window and make some kind of distraction with a flashlight. Uh, or noise that you can alert the neighbors or the fire department where you're at. We talk about with, with kids and things about uh, 
clothing catching on fire, you know, stop, drop, and roll, and all those things. How does that affect the, uh, the impaired? The impaired needs to practice uh, putting the fire out by patting, smothering the fire. Obviously, it's, it's hard for, for someone that's disabled to, to stop, drop, and roll. So we recommend that they pat the, the clothing out uh, with another object, uh, a, a piece of cloth. Pat the fire out, remove the oxygen, and smother it. Thanks very much, Chief. Let's review our fire safety tips for persons living with disabilities and then see how we did on our spot quiz. If you suffer from a disability or know of someone who does, be aware of these fire safety tips. Use smoke detectors on every level of your house. Remember to test them monthly and change the batteries at least once a year. If you can't reach the test button on your smoke alarm, ask someone to inspect it for you. Also, ask your fire department for special alarms available if you have a hearing impairment. Understand your limitations. Be honest with yourself about what you're not able to do, and don't be afraid to ask for assistance. If your mobility is impaired, for example, consult your health care provider or caregiver for alternatives to the stop, drop, and roll procedure. Also, consider moving your sleeping quarters to the ground floor. Inform others of your special needs. Make sure your neighbors are aware of any limitations that could play a part in a speedy response to a fire. Contact your local fire and emergency providers to keep your special needs information on file. Consider getting a monitored alarm service, which allow fire and medical emergency alarms to be transmitted directly to emergency dispatch centers. Have a prepared fire escape route free of clutter and accessible for wheelchairs or walkers if necessary. Practice your escape plan with your family members, the building manager, or neighbors. And if you or someone you live with can't escape alone, designate a member of the household to assist. Have a backup plan in case the designee is away at the time of the emergency. Keep keys to any exits handy by the bed. And if you have burglar bars, Make sure they have a release mechanism to allow you a way out. Now it's time to review our spot quiz for persons living with disabilities. What are your top two best tools for eliminating fire risks? Having a smoke detector in good working order and a planned escape route free of clutter. A close runner-up is communicating your special needs to neighbors and emergency personnel in case an emergency does arise. If you're hearing impaired, what good is a smoke alarm? Smoke alarms are now available for persons with hearing impairments. They're designed to flash a strobe light inside and also outside, or vibrate, alerting you that a fire's been detected. What's the key to making a clean getaway if your residence does catch on fire? Knowing your escape route and practicing it. Let your neighbors or building manager know your special needs and involve them in your practice drills. Assign an assistant if needed and make them part of your drill too. No one understands the unique circumstances of your particular disability better than you. Communicate your special needs to those around you. Be a survivor. Don't let an emergency catch you completely unprepared. The time to plan your evacuation is not during an emergency. Find ways to make your home more defensible against wildfire. What have you got to lose? Accept everything. Where we live can have an impact on our fire safety situation. Rural residents, apartment dwellers, and manufactured homeowners all face unique risk based on their living arrangements. When we return, we'll review how a move from the suburbs to a rural area will make you rethink fire safety. First though, a spot quiz. Let's test our knowledge of different housing situation fire risks. Where's the most common place in a rural home that fires start? What is a defensible area? What is one of the most common causes of apartment fires? 
Where's the safest place to barbecue if you live in an apartment? What should you do if you're trapped in an apartment fire? What is the leading cause of fires in manufactured homes? Stay tuned and we'll review the answers later. Each year, fire claims the lives of 4,000 Americans, injures tens of thousands, and causes billions of dollars worth of damage. People living in rural areas are more than twice as likely to die in a fire than those living in mid-sized cities or suburban areas. Chief, what are some of the hazards that uh, people face in living in a rural area, some of the risk? Uh, some of the risk would be the uh, home heating system, uh, such as the fireplace, a wood-burning stove, uh, wildland fires, uh, the distance from the fire stations, and a limited water supply. What about uh, more specific uh, in, in the home themselves, uh, fireplaces, for instance? What are some uh, issues there? Uh, first of all, you should have your fireplace cleaned out annually uh, before you ever light your first fire for the winter time. Uh, there's creosote buildup or carbon buildup from burning from the previous years. Uh, you want to make sure that your, your, your flu is actually working. Uh, keep any combustible material three foot from the opening of the fireplace. Uh, and keep your, your roof cleaned off from any pine needles or, or leaves. And all your firewood should be stored at least 30 feet away from the residence um, because that could pose a, a problem if there was a wildland fire. You made a, a statement a moment ago, uh, mentioned uh, creosote, uh, a couple of terms that maybe we're familiar with are carbon, creosote, things like that. Uh, both can be prevalent. Uh, what do you think is the difference there uh, in the buildup of the, those two items? Well, first of all, you want to use seasoned wood. Uh, wood that's been dried, hardwoods, that won't produce a lot of creosote or carbon. And if, if you use the hardwoods that have been seasoned, uh, you'll limit your possibilities in the, uh, for a fire. Everything's dried out. You don't Correct. have that, that risk involved anymore. That's great. Um, people maybe tend to get a fire going in the fireplace. Something comes up. They have to go. Fire's left unattended. Bad move? That is definitely a bad move. I, I would recommend that you keep your fires small enough that they can burn themselves out. And also, you can add uh, doors, uh, the glass doors to your fireplace is also a safety feature. Uh, screens, both below and up on top of the chimney as well? Yes, because you can have the popping from the wood burning. Uh, they could pop into the house and catch the carpet on fire. So the screen or glass will give some limited protection. Uh, the fire size, I mean, you just can't get a raging fire going in a fireplace and expect it not to cause some type of damage one way or the other, true? True. I, I would limit. I would limit the the burning in the fireplace. Keep them to a reasonable sizes, uh, to about a quarter of the size of the actual firebox, the opening. That uh, that creosote danger. Uh, you know, I, I personally have seen many chimney fires uh, from that build up. Uh, can you explain what happens once that creosote or that high carbon builds up? Uh, it comes to a point where something's got to give. What typically happens there? Uh, it actually builds up on the inside of the flue pipe. And in some cases, it actually closes it off and the smoke will back up into the residence. So you want to make sure that you can get that area cleared out and, and, and your fireplace is actually working properly and the heat is rising through the uh, flue pipe. Is there any chance that this stuff can actually ignite itself? Even if it doesn't close the flue pipe, can it actually catch on fire itself? Yes, after a period of time, uh, if you burn pine, for an example, uh, the rising in the pine will be collected. It's flammable. It will ignite and cause a fire in your flue. Big fire, I would imagine, a lot of, a lot of damage, uh, a lot of high heat all the way up to the top of that chimney. That is correct. And, and some fireplaces are, are, are pre-manufactured boxes, uh, UL approved, but there's a double wall fire flue pipe that's used uh, to vent the, the hot air. The brick fireplaces uh, are built out of brick and mortar, and sometimes uh, if you have a crack in the brick, that the heat from these fires can actually get into the attic spaces and cause, cause substantial damage to the house. Okay, so uh, fireplace, you certainly want to be safe there. Uh, but another, another version of wood burning in the home is wood burning stoves. Uh, I personally have uh, run calls in, in my time that uh, these people had burned very hot fires in there and the, the pipe going up through the ceiling uh, wired off to the rafters. Uh, we know what heat transfer is, conduction. Running that heat up that, that pipe gets it, you know, cherry red, as, so to speak. Uh, and fire starting up in the attic. Uh, what are some considerations as far as wood burning stoves go? I would actually recommend and it, it, to have 18 inches clearance from any combustible building products. 
and then you'll limit the, the possible heat transfer and uh, the possibility of an, of an ignition to a fire, to start a fire. Uh, proper wall, proper floor, uh, nothing that's going to be a risk there as well? I would limit the, the distance from combustible or flammable material. Uh, what about, uh, uh, you mentioned seasoned wood for the fireplace, same thing for the wood burning stove? The same thing for the wood burning stove and I would limit the amount of wood that I put into the wood burning stove. Uh, let's go outside the house now. What about uh, the risk of living in the woods uh, and the dangers that wildfires can present if you don't properly take care of your, your outside living area of your home in the woods? Yes, Sonny, we have to make sure we clear any vegetation that's directly around the perimeter of our homes. I would recommend a 30-foot uh, buffer zone. Keep it cleared up. Uh, you don't want to have any wildland fires that are burning out of control and come up to your residence. What actions can uh, some of the homeowners take uh, to prevent damage from firefighters in, in some of these uh, scenarios? Well, keeping a, a clean space around the home, keeping the pine needles off the rooftops, the leaves, uh, keep those things away from your, from your house in the event that you have any sparks or embers that come from another fire. And being in a rural area, obviously the fire department is, is some time frame away from your normal responses. So you want to you want to protect your property uh, as much as possible. Uh, any any uh, fire so, uh, fire water supply systems out there? Uh, there's not typically very many hydrants, is there? No, you you probably won't see a lot of uh, hydrants in the rural areas, but you can utilize ponds or swimming pools, and you could use them to draft from. The homeowners actual swimming pool at their home. That is the fire, correct. The fire department can actually if, use that. If you can use what what we call a floater pump. It's a portable pump that you can put into a swimming pool and run your hose from, and, and uh, actually it, it works pretty effectively. Uh, you know, in the, in the city, uh, you know, you can't just take a pile of leaves or limbs and burn them right there in your yard. Out in the country, you don't have those, uh, those regulations stopping you from doing that. Can people doing that, can that be a hazard? Yes, definitely. Uh, in, in many jurisdictions, there is there's no burning because of the close proximity of the houses. Uh, in the rural areas, uh, maybe half acre or one acre lots, you'll see more people uh, uh, wanting to burn their, their yard debris. There's so many leaves and branches that fall, they want to they wanna rake them up and burn them. Um, if it's a clear distance away from the residence or you're burning in a barrel, you, will, you may limit the, the amount of risk that you could have a potential fire. But when you have a residence that's, that's 10 feet away from your residence, uh, obviously there's a, there's a definite risk factor there that you may catch your neighbor's house on fire. Probably high wind would be a factor Definitely. as well. I don't want to do that. Well, thanks very much for that information. That's some great information for those people living in rural areas. Up next, fire tips for apartment dwellers. My dad is a hero. He goes into places normal people want to get away from. He rescues families, makes everyone safe. But the best thing he can do is come home. The U.S. Fire Administration reminds you to protect the heroes who protect our lives. Have a smoke alarm on every floor. Test it monthly. Replace the battery yearly. Do your part to get out before they have to come in. Apartment complexes are simply a series of small, connected homes. It's important to remember that what you do in your apartment can affect people living six doors down or even in the next building. The downstairs or next door apartment is on fire, it can quickly spread to connecting apartments in a matter of minutes. Chief, what are some of the uh, hazards that uh, people face living in apartments? Sonny, I would make sure that the smoke detectors in working order. Make sure all your fire hydrants are accessible and your fire lanes are clear. What about the, uh, the fact that some apartment complexes, uh, the apartment itself, that unit, may not even have a back door. What are some solutions there? In a lot of cases you won't have a back door. Uh, your window is your second means of egress and if you're living off the first floor on the second or third floor uh, you can purchase a chain ladder which hooks to your window and you can actually climb down the ladder. In the event that you can't get out the ladder or you, or you, you may have some kind of disability that prevents that, you obviously want to protect yourself in that room and, and make some kind of uh, uh, alert to the fire department emergency service to let them know that you need help to get out. We've talked a lot about smoke alarms today. Uh, in the apartment complex, uh, whose responsibility is that? Is that the management or is that the individual or who should, who should be responsible for that? If you're renting in an apartment complex, it's usually the management's responsibility to maintain the smoke detectors and in most cases have a fire extinguisher available in the residence. 
if the management hasn't, I would recommend that you take every precaution to make sure that your battery is working and your smoke detector is in operation at all times. I guess the key would be uh, being safe in the first place uh, in that apartment, not, not waiting until something bad like that happens. Uh, what would be some of those tips uh, for living safely in an apartment building? Uh, definitely want to have a, a home escape plan again. Uh, make sure you practice the, the escape plan. Uh, make sure that you have a meeting place outside. The same things we talked about in the residence. Uh, probably not much different than the home. The fire extinguishers, the smoke alarms. Uh, uh, one thing I've seen is barbecue pits. People live in apartment complexes, but you'll see them uh, grilling hamburgers on their balcony. Safe? Not at all. I would, I would not recommend barbecuing on a balcony in any apartment complex. Obviously, there's a, a large potential uh, for life loss. Uh, so you want to make sure that you have the, the, the people barbecue on the ground floor away from the building. I would bring my barbecue pit at least 25 to 30 foot away from the building. Parking in an, in an apartment complex uh, can be tricky just to get in and out, just to go back and forth from work. Uh, how does that affect uh, the fire department coming in to respond to a fire in an apartment building or apartment complex? It's very important, uh, Sonny. As you know, uh, we have to size up the situation, uh, place our apparatus in effective uh, locations so we can actually put out the fires the most effective way we've been trained. Thank you very much once again. I'm sure those apartment dwellers watching appreciate that information also. When we return, special concerns for manufactured homeowners. More than 4,000 Americans die each year in fires. Nearly 80% of those happen in the home. That's why it's so important to have working smoke alarms. They can double your chances of surviving a fire. Place a smoke alarm on each level of your house. Check smoke alarms monthly to make sure they work. Change the batteries twice a year. And teach children what to do when they hear the alarm sound. Keep your home safe. Don't play with fire. Fires in manufactured homes claim the lives of 345 Americans each year and injure 765 more. Many of these fires are caused by heating and electrical system malfunctions and improper storage of combustibles. Manufactured homes have a fire death almost 50% higher than the rate of other dwellings. Young children account for more than one-fifth of all fire deaths in manufactured homes. Chief, what seems to be some of those common fire hazards found in uh, manufactured homes? Uh, electrical system malfunctions and heating fires, and also the lack of smoke detectors. Well, what are some of the ways to prevent those electrical problems in the manufactured home? I would have all, all the electrical work done by a licensed contractor to, to make sure that everything is installed properly. Are there some clues to let you know that you have uh, an electrical problem, uh, flickering lights and such? That's correct, and, and those are indicators to let you know to, to have someone come out immediately and check your electrical system. Uh, if your lights are flickering or when you plug an appliance in, uh, you may have some arcing. Uh, you want to have sparks. Sparks. Sure. You, you may have some worn or frayed uh, uh, wires. You want to have electricians come in and, and check those things and make sure that they're, they're safe. How about uh, electrical cords, whether it's an appliance cord or an extension cord used in that home? Uh, any way that you can tell whether or not that wire is currently being overloaded? Uh, it's very possible that you, your breakers will trip uh, in the event you have overheating of the, of the wires. And I would take very uh, uh, seriously the, the caution to not overload the circuits in a, in a mobile home. To prevent that, that overload, uh, what would you recommend uh, a number of appliances uh, to limit? To, to an outlet. I would unplug one appliance before I plugged in another appliance into an outlet. That would prevent maybe that arcing and overloading happening at, uh, at, at the same time. Yes. Uh, bulb burnout. You know, you just, you put a bulb in, two days later it's out. Is that a, would that be a good clue? That is definitely a clue. Uh, and also, I would like to make the point that the electrical wiring that comes in the, the manufactured homes are a little different than what you see in in your residential uh, building construction. A little lighter weight? A little lighter, lighter weight, gauge. correct. So, sure. of course, that's going to make it uh, more apparent that you could have a, a potential for electrical fire hazard in the future. So you want to have it checked out periodically. We talked earlier about extension cords and overloading of extension cords. Uh, 
you know, some people may not overload a cord, but they may use an extension cord and then maybe put it under an area rug in their home. Is that a smart thing to do? No, I would, I would not recommend any extension cords running under rugs or under the carpet uh, because it, it's not visible. You can't see if it's been worn. So you want to keep those extension cords visible. That way you can check them to see if they're being worn out. Okay. So let's talk about worst case scenario. Uh, there's been an overload. There's been a short of some type and uh, this manufactured home in a rural area catches on fire. Uh, what can the homeowner expect uh, to, to happen in relation to fire department response and the amount of combustibles that that home contains uh, and the burning time that, that it may go through? Sonny, uh, on an average, a mobile home or pre-manufactured home will burn completely in around six minutes. So you want to take every precaution to get out the, the mobile home safely. Uh, obviously, your smoke detectors would have to alert you and let you get out the home. You're going to have a water supply problem being in a rural area. So I would recommend possibly turning your breakers off uh, onto your electrical service and trying to minimize the damage uh, until the fire department arrives. Uh, you bring up another question there. Um, six minutes, uh, you know, can, can most fire departments make it to a, to a manufactured home, a, a house trailer, so to speak, in six minutes or less? On an average, uh, fire departments should try to, to respond within a four-minute period. Uh, in a lot of cases, that's, that can't happen. So you want to take every precaution to protect your residents, whether it be a, a house or a mobile home, uh, any event you have a fire. Uh, any other uh, considerations that, uh, that, that you might consider as far as, you know, we talked before about the wildland side of it and keeping things clear and all that. Um, underneath trailers, uh, you know, things tend to build up. Uh, any way to prevent that? Yes, uh, I would install the skirting around a, a manufactured home to keep any of the, the yard debris, the leaves, the pine needles from blowing underneath the mobile home. And that would prevent any sparks from a wildland fire or a trash fire blowing under the, uh, the mobile home. You keep that, just keep that area nice and clean. Keep that area uh, clean under the mobile home and also I would keep a cleaned area within a, a 30 foot radius around the mobile home. Prevent any possibility of a, of a, a woods fire or a rubbish fire getting close up to the mobile home. Well thanks once again for that information. Now it's time to review how you did on the spot quiz. Let's review your housing safety knowledge. Where is the most common place in a rural home that fires start? In rural areas, more fires start in the chimney than in any other place of the home. Creosote is an unavoidable product of burning wood. Have wood burning stoves and chimneys inspected and cleaned annually by a certified chimney specialist. Also, never use gasoline to start a wood fire. And never burn trash in your fireplace. What is a defensible area? A defensible area is the place around a home in rural areas created to avoid the threat of spreading wildfires. Thin out trees and brush within 30 feet around your home to eliminate combustibles for an approaching wildfire. Also use fire resistant protective roofing and materials like stone, brick and metal to protect your home. Avoid using wood materials that offer the least fire protection. What is one of the most common causes of apartment fires? In 2001, the most common cause of apartment fires was careless disposal of smoking materials. Empty all ashtrays into the toilet or a metal container every night before going to bed or wet cigarette butts and ashes before emptying ashtrays into a wastebasket. Where's the safest place to barbecue if you live in an apartment? Make sure the grill is on the ground floor and away from the building, not under attached covered patios, balconies, covered walkways, or roof overhangs. What should you do if you're trapped in an apartment fire? Use a mobile phone to stay in touch with 911 dispatchers. Seal yourself in for safety. And stay low by the window. Shine a flashlight or wave a sheet out the window to alert firefighters that you're trapped. What is the leading cause of fires in manufactured homes? Electrical system malfunctions are the leading causes of fire in manufactured homes. Have electrical devices professionally installed. Some clues that you may have an electrical problem are flickering lights, warm electrical cords, frequent blown fuses, and frequent bulb burnout. 
In less than 30 seconds, a small flame can get completely out of control, and in minutes, a house can be engulfed in flames. No matter what your limitations are or where you live, if you make the effort to install and maintain smoke detectors, as well as practice a fire escape drill, you will more than double your chances of survival. Fight fire with facts on fire. Thanks for joining us.